Welcome uh, to our podcast. This is episode two. Um, and this podcast is where we uh, bring people together uh, from the world of sports, uh, from the world of music and film to talk about their passions, their compassions, and why they do what they do. Um, today, we have a special guest. I want to um, first, though, introduce you to uh, my co-host. I'm Tim Gorey. I'm uh, Executive Director for Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. I have with me um, uh, my pastor, Greg Davidson, Senior Pastor of Trinity Baptist Church in Vacaville, and uh, Bobby Evans, the former General Manager of Baseball's San Francisco Giants with us. We are co-hosts, we are friends, and we have uh, a special guest with us today. Bobby, would you introduce our special guest today? Yeah, no, my pleasure, Tim. Thank you, and good to be with you. Uh, we have Dave Jouse, a uh, longtime uh, coach and scout in Major League Baseball, uh, just a, a, a very uh, dear friend, but also just a great baseball man. Uh, so much experience with a number of organizations. I think the Red Sox, the the Pirates most recently, but uh, Dodgers, Orioles, uh, now the Yankees, uh, formerly at one point even the Mets. And uh, we're just honored to have you, Dave. Thank you for joining us. It's a it's my honor to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a it's a it's a new new world, new age that we're doing this. That I can't hug you and and say hey to see you, but it's the it's it's what the new normal is, and, and I'm getting used to it. Technology wise, I'm not used to it, but talking to a phone or a computer on a Google or Zoom or anything, I'm getting used to it. So I look forward to the time that we're going to share. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks, Dave. Well, just a, a, a question, just to start us out. Uh, you know, you've you've had a, a wide range of, of uh, experiences in, in the game of baseball. In fact, you know, my first memory of you was in high school. You were the head coach at Atlantic Christian College uh, there in North Carolina, and you were recruiting a couple of my teammates. Um, duly noted that you didn't recruit me. Uh, but you were recruiting a couple of my teammates, and then uh, shortly thereafter, your your professional career started uh, with the major league club, and and you've you've gone on since then. Bobby, thanks, and and boy, I feel feel guilty because uh, I I really overlooked you from what I remember is that you were way too good a student for the guy, the guys I was recruiting. Atlanta Christian was a beautiful college that uh, allowed me an opportunity to uh, better myself and and experience. A head coaching position. I I do believe that uh, we've got a, a, a handful of players that were borderline students, players first. That they ended up graduating, but uh, they they were they were baseball players first, and and, and it was not I was was not being the, the the best student. Um, so it was a, it was a great experience for me. I loved being down in North Carolina. However, that was that was about seven years into my coaching career already because I started one day after my last at bat as a college player at Amherst College in a little school in Massachusetts. I was managing a professional Canadian senior league team up in Woodstock, New Brunswick. And, and as I, I often say is that most people have to get out of playing because they get hurt, because they don't get seen, you know, scouts don't see them because they're at a small school or they don't have good coaching. Well, both my high school coach and my, my college coach are in our Hall of Fames, College Hall of Fame, High School Hall of Fame. Um, eight players on my team at Amherst College signed professional contracts my senior year. So they were seen. There were a whole lot of scouts there. And I never got hurt a day in my life. I'm still 63 years old and I throw 20 minutes of BP every day. I, I, I don't get hurt. So the only reason I didn't play – any further was complete lack of talent. I had to get that stopwatch early on. Um, but I, I, I always enjoyed teaching the game, even as a player, learning the game as a player, learning from coaches, learning from scouts in the stands, um, from my teammates, from opposition. And I was able to, to hop right into coaching and, and managing teams and so I was in Woodstock, New Brunswick. I was in the Cape League. I was at Westfield State College, Atlanta Christian College in, in Wilson, North Carolina, where I met you and saw you play as a high school player. 
Uh, and then I got an opportunity. Uh, I interviewed with Jerry Manuel, who was a longtime uh, major league manager um, with the White Sox and then the Mets. He was a field coordinator from the Expos. And he talked with me and interviewed me down in West Palm Beach. And he hired me as a Gulf Coast League manager without any professional playing experience. And, and then I, I went on seven years with the Expos, managing in the system, advanced scout in the system. Um, and then I went to the Orioles for a year and then uh, joined on with the Red Sox, was able to, to get my first major league coaching position in, with Jimmy Williams in 1997. I was with the Red Sox for 10 years and then joined Grady Little staff and, and the Dodgers. Um, in 06 and I was with him for two years and then Dave Tremblay with the Orioles in, in his dugout for two years, then mm -hmm. back with Jerry Manuel with the Mets for a couple of years with Clint Hurdle over the last seven of the last eight years in the dugout and one year as a, um, as a scout pro scout. And then, uh, this year I, I joined the Yankees as a, uh, as a pro scout. Dave, congratulations on your new position with the New York Yankees. And being a longtime Yankee fan and having been in the new stadium, which is absolutely fantastic, I think about all the legendary players, Ruth, Garrett, DiMaggio, Mantle, all the way up to, to present day or near present day, Rodriguez. And I think about you and your new position as a scout. It has to be tremendous pressure to – know the expectations of the organization and of New Yorkers for you to produce that kind of talent to take the Yankees back to greatness where, where they always feel like that they belong? That's a really good question. I, uh, I, I will start by saying that I learned how to evaluate talent and, and so-called scout um, when I was six years old, my dad was a sports writer with the Chicago Tribune, 50 years with the Tribune. He actually had the first nationally televised uh, sports talk show, um, Sports Channel America in 1986. I think it started four guys, Bill Gleason, Rick Talender, Ben Bentley, and my dad sat around a table and smoked cigars and screamed and yelled at each other for an hour. It was like being in, actually, it was like being in our living room when he and his buddies used to to watch games or come back after uh, watching the Northwestern Wildcats or the Chicago Bears and scream and yell with my mom saying, isn't this fun watching these guys, these old guys talk about the game? Um, but at six years old, I would use his pass and go to Wrigley Field Bleachers and learn from the 70-year-old retired guys that knew the game because they watched every day. They watched games out there and and we would take dimes and nickels off the 18 year old punks that would bet them that something was going to happen. The 70 year old guys knew because they had watched the game and observed the game. So I listened to them and learned. Um, and then I continued with my experience as a player. And then as a, as a coach to, to learn what evaluating talent is because I've always been told and continue to be told that every position in baseball, the most important part outside of being relational is evaluating talent. Um, if you evaluate talent as a coach, you're good. If you evaluate talent as a manager, it's, it's, it's paramount in setting your lineup and using players in the possibility in the best chance to succeed as a general manager, like Bobby was um, to evaluate talent. So you make the right trades. So I took the experience I had of coaching, of teaching, and then um, in professional baseball, listening to the, the veteran professional scouts all the way back to thinking about the 70 year old guys in the stands in Wrigley Field um, and, and use those that experience so that my eyes watch the game, not in training the players, but in all of a sudden evaluating what they were now and what they would be, how they looked similar to the Mickey Mantles or um, or Horace Clarks that I saw with the Yankees or where I grew up in, in Chicago, the Glenn Beckers, Don Kessingers, Randy Hundley's, Fergie Jenkins. Um, and so you, you put those, you use your eyes and your experience and say, whoa, this player could become that if he learns this or if he does this or if he grows into this spot. Um, and so that is, that is what 
that I learned scouting early on because I used it as a, as a coach and a manager also, and as a farm director and a field coordinator. And now, and I know we talked about it before we got on the podcast. Now I have learned with the Yankees in the first three months with them so much more because there is quantitative analytics, technology, biomechanics, all sorts of things that I have a, what wasn't, privy to back in the 80, excuse me, eighties and nineties. And even in the dugout the last seven years, and I'm learning now to use that and use the people that are really highly qualified and knowledgeable in those areas so that we have a better opportunity to, as you say, have the next generation of Yankee players win five, six, seven years in a row. Sorry, all you non-Yankee fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that is great. I, I, I love to hear that, Dave. Um, and it, it, it's speaking of non-Yankee fans. And, I, and number one, too, I, I just want to say um, you, you can hear the excitement in your voice when you talk about the passion in your voice when you talk about what you do. Um, and that it gets me, you know, excited to uh, to hear you talk about that. Um, I I kind of want to switch gears though a little bit um, from from the Yankees, and and I'd love to hear you talk about 2004. Um, you were with the Red Sox during that year, and uh, there was a little thing that even people who are not baseball fans are a lot of times familiar with called the curse of the Bambino, right? That that year, uh, that curse was broken and you were a part of that. Um, tell us a little bit about what it was like to be a part of that team and what sort of the roller coaster you guys went through um, to, to end up coming out on top. Uh, that's a great, great question, uh, Tim. I, I, I really like it and I'm gonna go back because yesterday's a, a good example my wife is a uh, Christian nonfiction author, um, speaker. She works for Compassion International with Compassion International. Um, and we had a lady over yesterday who she had, who had met her at one of her speaking engagements down here in Naples at a church when she was speaking, I think a MOPS uh, speaking engagement actually. And uh, the lady's a photographer. And so my wife wants to get some new pictures for her website. She's got a second book um, to the publishing house. And so some she wants to do, well, sure enough, the lady is from Boston and Rhode Island, from Providence, Rhode Island. And in the middle of their conversation, she was talking about how, what a diehard Red Sox fan she was. And she, my wife has jerseys in our living room of all six clubs I've been with. And uh, one of them's the Red Sox. And so my wife goes, hey, can you go to the room and, pick out something she might want to see. And sure enough, I go and get the ring, the O4 ring. And, and I don't live in Boston anymore, but for the, the six years after we won in Boston, I would win that, wear that ring anywhere. And I would never have to wait for the tea because people would let me go. I would never have to wait in line for a restaurant. And I'm, I, they still don't know what my face looks like but they knew what my ring was. And that ring is on, as my wife says, thousands of cell phone pictures in Boston. It was a, it was a tremendous opportunity for me and my family um, because we lived in Boston. Now, if you didn't live in Boston, it, it's still, it's, it, it's, it's great. But living in Boston, it was the first time I had been living in a city where we were working. And so the kids didn't know Dad was, you know, when I was, they didn't know that, that I, it was a big deal that I was coaching before that. They didn't, and they shouldn't. But with the Red Sox, I would bring, I would bring their friends to the field. I would bring the, fam, the moms and dads to the field. And sure enough, the boys at young age, eight and six and, and two, but eight and six-year-olds with their friends, they'd run on the field like it was a park. The parents would be on the field and they'd be grabbing dirt and putting in their pockets because they had grown up as, as fanatical Red Sox fans. Well, sure enough, that year I was the advanced scout. I'm in, I'm in Houston covering the, the 
the Houston Astros against the St. Louis Cardinals. We're down three, nothing. My wife's saying, Hey, why don't you come home? There's no chance. And both Kevin Millar and Tito Francona called me that day and said, if we win one game, we're winning the series against the Yankees. And sure enough, things go through. I get to go to St. Louis to both Boston and St. Louis for the world series. I give the reports each day beforehand as the advanced scout for the pitchers, for the position players get to throw BP on the field and then watch the game in the stands. Sure enough, my wife and I are on our field at the, at the, the third out of the bottom of the ninth in St. Louis before Henry's on the field, Lucino's on the field. I'm right in the middle of, of, of uh, Ortiz and Pedro who are really close friends of, of my family. And then on the duck boat tour, uh, the duck boat parade, um, we're on uh, with Jason Veritek, Doug Marabelli, Trot Nixon, Gabe Kapler, um, with all of our families there. And sure enough, at the end of, at the end of that, after the parade, which was amazing, we, you know, 2 million people at the parade in the, in the Charles river, at the end, we had had, we had a housewarming party that we had set up three months before we had moved from Brighton to, to West Roxbury. And we had about 175 people and a, pig picking at our house in a rainstorm afterwards. Now, when I talk about this and I'm, I know I'm digressing a little bit, but the most important to digress, the thing to digress about as impactful as that was for the city of Boston and my family, 2004, the most important day of 2004 was December 6th when my family and I got baptized together mm. in Watertown. And there is, I can talk about the, the parade. I can talk about the seventh game in New York, New York. I can talk about the fourth game in St. Louis, but there's no doubt that I was impacted by our Lord and Savior. And my family was impacted by my Lord, our Lord and Savior more on December 6th of 2004 in Watertown when we were baptized together. That and seeing my three boys born are the four most in, 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 uh, you know, impactful days that I've ever had in my life. So, Dave, uh, it's incredible, uh, incredible uh, story, incredible finish to a, to a tremendous historical year, 2004, to be baptized. So we, you, you've, uh, uh, you've come to know the Lord sometime before 2004. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about your journey? I, uh, I was, I was raised in Chicago, as we talked about before, I was raised in a, in a Christian home. Um, we went to church every Sunday. I was with the high school fellowship group doing, uh, outreaches up in Michigan and Wisconsin a couple times a year. Um, I knew I was a good person. I was confident I was I was doing good. I was confident I was uh, pleasing my mom and dad. I was pleasing coaches. I was a good student. Got an opportunity to go to Amherst College. And, uh, because I could play basketball and baseball, it was, it was before they became a co-ed um, college. And so they got me in where I probably sh would not have on my own academic accord got there. So that was another thing to pat myself on the back. I, I wasn't a big ego guy, but you know, I, 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 I did like the accolades. Amherst was a great opportunity. And, and then I got into coaching and I was going to be, I was going to get into professional baseball. It took me a while to get into professional baseball. It took me seven years of doing a lot of things. And, um, I was, I was in control of that. Um, got to meet a wonderful lady and, um, we got married and had kids and got into professional baseball and my career was flying. As I mentioned about being with the Expos and the Orioles and the, the Red Sox and in the big league dugout. I also managed uh, winter ball in Venezuela and Dominican. And, you know, I, I, I knew I was going to be a major league manager and I did the right things and put the, I checked off my time with my kids. I, I, whenever I was not doing baseball, I spent time with my kids. I was doing good. I was in control. My, I, and I was winning a, a 
Dominican League Caribbean Series Championship in 1999. Third year, third year in the dugout with the Red Sox. And my wife said, you, you're, you're not the man I married. Uh, we're going to separate. And, and I had all sorts of reasons why she didn't need to separate because I was better than everybody else. I was better as a dad. I was better as a husband. I didn't cheat. I didn't beat you. I brought, I didn't spend money myself. All, all sorts of reasons why. Um, and she said, well, you're, you're not, you, you've got baseball well ahead of things. And, um, so it's a tough time to talk about it. You know, it, it, it really is. Um, because we were, we were both, we were both going down different paths. And I, that's the last thing I wanted because I was, I, I, I all of a sudden wasn't in control. And the other thing was, when that happened, the hole in my heart was gigantic. There was something that wasn't filling that I was filling it with everything else. There was a lady that, that Billy went to as a counselor that was a non-Christian counselor. We, we don't know what her background was. It was not a Christian counselor that we went to. And her questions to us together after each of us meeting her was, when was the last time you were satisfied and satisfied with each other? And we looked back and said, wow, but maybe, maybe the times we were really going to church together because we would go to church, but not, not all the time. And she said, well, you need to go back to church. And so we ended up going back to church and that wasn't, it wasn't for us. It was for individually. Each of us went to church. We went as a family, but we went to church. And all of a sudden, the Lord who had been knocking on my ears all the time that I would say, heck, I went to church every time as a, as a, as a youngster, as a teenager, as a preteen, I, I could say I never, I never heard Jesus preached and definitely the gospel te- tre- preached I know it was. I, I, I kind of know it was. I kind of know that it was my fault that I didn't hear. But it definitely wasn't preached the way that all of a sudden it was being preached to me. And so each of us, both my wife and I, gave ourselves with the, my, my help with our, our pastor, my wife, Billy's help with the pastor's wife, unbeknownst to us that both of them were sharing with the other one we both realized that 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 we had not been saved and given our life and given a a relationship with our lord and savior and by that all of a sudden our marriage flourished and blossomed um our family flourished and blossomed and since that time I've, i've then been um mentored by the baseball chaplain with the Red Sox. And I would use that ring to speak to groups of a hundred. And I I didn't want to, other than being in in uniform and with a fungo bat, I didn't want to talk to talk with anybody. I would never get in front of people. Um, But mentored by him and I would speak in front of groups, 50 to a hundred, 150 at, at churches, at lions clubs, at, at uh, Legion posts, um, and, uh, and it, we, we had given, my wife and I have given our life in baseball as our mission field. And we serve in all sorts of areas from compassion international down in the Dominican to in the stands, my wife with uh, wives, baseball wives, as, as we know from, from the parable. In fact, it's easier for a camel to get into, into the kingdom of God than, 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 uh, and then a rich man, and but, but with the Lord, everything's impossible. And everything's possible because with people, it's impossible. Well, that's that's where uh, that's where we uh, we serve in, in in the baseball field also. Dave, I I know you're in Naples right now, and I was a resident there for eight years as a pastor, and I I know that they're a great place, by the way. And I know there are a lot of Christian ballplayers, coaches, 
in Naples and people like Terry Dean, Gary Quazzo. And I know there's a, there's a theme, there's a, there's a heart passion there among them that they want to move from success in, in sports. They, they want to have success in sports, but they also want significance in, in their personal lives and ministries. And so I, I think about you and I think about the significance that you've had working with Compassion International, an organization that is reaching 2.2 million children all over the world, and particularly your work in the Dominican Republic with these children. Could you tell us a little bit about your work and about uh, some of your involvement with Compassion? I appreciate you asking that question because our heart is is for our Lord, both both Billy and my my wife and myself. And we have been given, we've been blessed with an opportunity to serve in all sorts of areas. Um, in as 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 I mentioned before, from from big league fields to when with the Pirates, I'd I'd I'd, I'd serve in mornings with Light of Life. Um, with the Orioles, I served at helping up. Um, my wife has always, when we've been in the Dominican and Venezuela, as as managing and coaching there, um, we had reached out into the towns because we we live in the town. We never lived in a in a hotel. We lived in the city. We got an apartment, lived in the city. We would go out and 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 serve on in in areas that we could. We we'd find the kids on the street and take them. And so our heart is there. Well, since my wife has joined Compassion and um, we in in the Dominican, we personally have a um, sponsor, a women's survival program in San Pedro, where the last time I was managing in the winter ball um, before this coming winter, because I'm going to Escajito this coming winter. But the last time was 2011 in San Pedro. Well, two blocks from that stadium is where we have a women's, we sponsor a women's survival program that helps women that are pregnant through a church there, which I think is some of the, the best uh, understanding of what, where Compassion International comes through is it is church sponsored in the areas that they sponsor the kids or in our situation, sponsor the women's survival program. And so we take, um, they take that church takes women that they um, they vet out at, at, at pregnant ladies and they get them through their pregnancy, healthy pregnancies, and then they serve them and their children to raise that children in their church sponsored groups. Um, and it is, uh, we, we, we serve in our backyard here in, in Naples and Immokalee. We serve in our backyard when we've been in the Dominican. We serve in our backyard when we've been in Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Boston. Um, uh, and it's just, uh, it, it's amazing what Jesus Christ has allowed us to serve and see because we get blessed doing those things, I, I believe, much more than the, the, the people get blessed by doing those things. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. And we love your story, and I know you're going to have great success with the Yankees. I, I think the only thing you have to fear is if Bobby goes to an opposing club and his success with that club eclipses what you're trying to attempt to do at the, with the Yankees. But thank you for joining us as we each week will interview individuals who have had great success in the film industry, sports industry, also in Christian music. But until next time, God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.